thank you for inviting me as well. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be with you today. Um, I keep on changing my presentation. I think I said exactly the same thing last year, actually, because I really want to make sure, um, as the first speaker, I really set that um, very broad agenda, because I know you've got some uh, amazingly good speakers to follow me as well. So um, I want to kind of think about what's going on in the marketplace. And then I want to kind of supplement that with some ideas and some examples of best practice. Um, but the first thing I did um, before, um, before really kind of putting the presentation together is kind of reflected on what I said last year. And last year, I think I made the comment uh, in my presentation that we actually are in living in a really exciting times in terms of development and sustainability. And um, just thinking about the, the year that's passed since I was here last time, I think that statement um, is as true today as it was when I made it, say, 12 months ago. I think what's probably particularly interesting is the fact that um, some of the changes we talked about at last year's conference were about uh, organic and incremental change. We talked about life cycle analysis and life cycle costs. We're actually starting to see some um, incredibly fast changes as well, and actually some quite big disruptive changes. Uh, I don't think I would have been, uh, I, I would have thought, standing here last year, I would have told you that I've actually uh, been in a driverless vehicle not once but four times this year. And that change that we're starting to see in terms of some of the technologies and some of our, our urban landscapes are really uh, quite dramatic. We're also seeing uh, a very big conversation about health and well-being. There's some great stats that are now coming uh, forward in terms of we spend 90% of our time now in buildings. We as human beings are not designed to live in buildings. We, 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 are, we, we sort of benefit from the natural environment, yet we're changing in terms of the way we, we live our lifestyles. And so we're seeing some quite dramatic changes in, in that space as well. So um, there's a lot going on. and. Um, I've got a lot to say, so hopefully I can cram it all into 20, 25 minutes. Um, another quick surrogate uh, of change, and I took these photographs so the quality isn't particularly good as I ran, uh, ran to get the, the airplane to come uh, and join you today. Um, our innovation park is, I think, a really good litmus test of what's going on in the marketplace. In the last six months, we've had four new buildings come onto our innovation park. And what's interesting to see there is these aren't zero carbon buildings. These are buildings which are basically uh, energy positive. They put more energy back into the grid than they take out. And we're starting to see developers really trying to drive that agenda. They're also thinking about resilience. So uh, this building here is, is very much about resilience and flood risk. It's also, say, energy positive. The other one is about decoupling. So it's about looking at affordability. How can we make sure that if we're building sustainable homes, they aren't the expensive homes, they are the affordable homes. And so people are starting to innovate and drive that agenda a lot. So, so where to start today's conversation? Well, um, I suppose it's a little bit of a test in some respect to see how awake you are. I, I noticed we didn't have any coffee this morning, so it's a little bit of a, a test. How many people have seen the Alien film? No hands, but one or two. Okay, so that for me is, is a, a relatively simple synopsis of the Alien film. It's kind of something that you can probably understand, and at this point the conference organisers are probably saying, where is Martin going with this? Um, I actually think this um, is interesting when you start to look at what it's trying to say to us. It's, you know, if you don't know the, um, what's going on, uh, assume the worst case scenario and don't get close to the unknown. That for me doesn't apply to people in this room. Because if you really want to drive change, it's about knowing what your mission is. And the GBC here, I think, is doing a great job. And just some of the conversations I've heard already this morning about the change and, and what the aspirations are to educate the market to, to drive that change uh, is incredibly important. So for me, one of my primary purposes in the next few minutes is to talk to you about what that change looks like. So I'm going to just... Um, break my presentation down into two parts, basically. I want to talk about what the drivers for change are, what are the things we're seeing that are happening internationally and in this country and across Europe and other places in the world, which are basically driving us to think differently. And then I want to take a relatively quick snapshot in terms of some of the people's reactions in terms of what that looks like. So what are the factors that are driving the change in the marketplace? Well, 
uh, I think one of the biggest factors is us. Uh, if we look at population, population is increasing. Um, it's an aging population. We're starting to see uh, four generations in the same household um, still in employment. We're starting to see um, a, a, an aging demographic. We're seeing a shift, and this is uh, uh, international figures, I'm not sort of focused on any one particular country. We're seeing a shift from rural to urban areas. So what does that actually mean for us? That means that uh, as we design our buildings, we need to think about mobility. We need to think about things like telemedicine. Uh, there's some big issues going on in the UK around telemedicine, but actually that has some interesting side effects because if we're building our houses to be more sustainable, we're really good at putting shiny insulation into those buildings, which actually is really bad in terms of connectivity. I've got a friend of mine who um, went to hospital recently and actually they wired him up and as he walked around his house, they were collecting data about his health and well-being. So when he arrived at hospital, they had some really sound information, some really detailed information about what was going on. That helped in terms of the cures being made. So there are these relationships we need to think about in terms of us as a society, what's going on and what does that mean? As I said before, we're seeing uh, a large increase in uh, urban densities. That has a massive impact as well in terms of how we design our city. So when we talk about comfort, it isn't just about thermal comfort, it has to be about acoustic comfort as well. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with Delos at the moment who are driving the, the well standard. Uh, and, and trying to understand what does that mean if we have very urban dense development, uh, what does that mean in terms of how we design our buildings? Because we need our silence, we need our space sometimes. If there's constant noise in those buildings, that actually isn't very good for our psychology. So the change in population is going to radically change the way we think. Um, and it's interesting actually when you start to look at the statistics and you wouldn't be surprised when you start to think about those mega cities those come from China and they come from India. But actually, it's very close to home as well. I mentioned at the very start that um, I've been very fortunate to sort of take a couple of rides in driverless vehicles. Some of that thinking now is permeating through developers in the way they are looking at the built environment. Uh, there's two developments which are, are kind of name check, I suppose. Um, we're working with Canary Wharf. They are actually starting to think about the next phase of their development. That will start to be constructed, or some of the phases that development will be constructed in 2040. So there will be designs which need to be taken account of, which actually take account of drone deliveries, which take account of driverless vehicles. We're looking at development, a resid resident residential development in North London, which is there again looking to actually finish its final phase in 2050. It's designing um, that urban form to think about what will the future look like at those times. Um, I've taken this um, this sort of slide from another company that we're working with at the moment because they are looking at remodelling, not new build, but existing urban areas as well. 30% of most urban cities relates to the car, and I know that's probably uh, much the same here uh, as well. And so if you start to think about what does the future look like, we're talking about a large amount of growth in our urban areas, but actually if we have less dependence on things like the car, then effectively some of those spaces become really powerful spaces. So you don't have roads that divide, divide communities, you have roads that actually, or spaces that actually combine communities. So a lot of, a lot of work's going on in that space. Uh, the other area which we're, we're working on a lot at the moment is to try and understand what makes a healthy city. Uh, we're working with a number of city mayors at the moment to truly understand what are the ingredients of making our urban form, our, our, our cities, more sustainable. It's about the availability of, of services. It's the availability of good, healthy food. It's about looking at resilience in those areas. It's about public space. We need to make sure that as we look to our cities and we grow our densities, that we are building ones which are healthy for us. Uh, some interesting research that came out of this with uh, various health organisations that that the, the amount of spend that is placed on badly designed cities, pollution, and the impact they have on us as people uh, is colossal. If we can actually try and uh, manage that, that actually means that we can uh, spend it more wisely somewhere else. Um, and that knowledge transfers into our standards. Uh, the thing that makes BRE um, 
particularly unique, I suppose, is the way we take our research, we take the conversations, which I know I will have with many of you today, and we actually look to make sure that our schemes and our standards uh, really reflect that. Uh, I put this up as an example because I think it was quite a nice example uh, in terms of we've, we've done some work in terms of what is a sustainable community uh, in Iceland. Um, in that part of the world, energy is quite cheap. Uh, there's a high dependency on the use of the car. But by looking at international best practice, we were saying, well, you need to reinstate uh, the sidewalks, you need to make sure there's pathways between buildings and actually allow people to walk between spaces when the weather allows because that is a healthy option in terms of driving change. Don't take maybe uh, a North American approach where you remove those and actually you land, uh, end up with more space for development. Think about the spaces and the connectivity between them and how you can get people to use them uh, more wisely. What's also changing uh, in this conversation is the way that um, it isn't about the West um, investing in the East. There's a massive change in terms of the way finance is working uh, across the world. I think that's particularly interesting in terms of the UK. We've had a couple of examples recently where major large infrastructure projects are going to be funded from China. So we had uh, Hinkley Point, which was a nuclear power station, and the funding for that was coming from France and from China. That actually changes the conversation because we're seeing a flow of finance in one direction and we're seeing a flow of skills and knowledge in another direction. So the point I'm trying to make here is we are much more international. If we forget the politics of the last few days in terms of America and what does that mean in terms of the world stage, uh, my take on this agenda is we're seeing a much more integrated society. We're seeing lots of sharing of ideas. That becomes important, and the point I'm making here, I suppose, is as we create our standards, we need to work closer together. I've had a, a couple of good conversations already this morning about your own rating tool working with us and how can we actually try and align them. Because if we can actually make sure that we don't confuse the market, but we actually supplement and share knowledge more effectively, that has to be powerful for everybody. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide. So I mentioned about partnerships. The, the other one, which I think is another good example in terms of partnerships, I've mentioned well. Uh, we're doing exactly the same thing there as we are with, um, with others as well, which is about how can we take good practice in terms of things like health and well-being, and how can we make sure that as we create our standards, they actually really work together in terms of that technology. Uh, another example in that same space is around the work we're doing with the Institute of Civil Engineers. Uh, they had a standard called SQL. We were developing BREAM infrastructure, but rather than creating them as competing standards, our real drive was to actually bring them together and to harmonise them so we can actually make the industry uh, see the benefits of a process-driven um, standard, but also a performance-based uh, standard as well. Um, in terms of some of this change that's going on, uh, resource, scarcity, resource scarcity is becoming more and more important. Uh, water I'm using is a bit of a surrogate here, but we're seeing worldwide a conversation about um, energy was important, now water is becoming even more important in terms of the way we've used it in the past, making sure it's more efficient. The cost of water has been very cheap, and that means that we're starting to see some really um, different technologies being inserted into our buildings. We're starting to see the use of black water treatment in buildings, and not just grey water, but we're actually seeing effluent being reused in buildings using uh, reverse uh, osmosis. We're seeing active carbon filters being placed in. And that is really important in terms of making sure we make decisions about new sources of supply as well as reuse. So technology is helping us in terms of uh, more efficient use of resources. Um, earlier on in my professional career, I worked on the UK Sustainable Development Strategy, and one thing which I think is really coming um, to bear in the marketplace is this issue about governance. Um, when we start to talk about how we drive change, there is a hunger, I think, for transparency. Uh, that slide or that diagram that's in front of you, I think, summarises quite well some of the key drivers that are really starting to shape this conversation. It is about knowledge, it is about science which drives the change that we, we need to see in our buildings. It is about making sure that although we talk about sustainability, we need to talk about economics, we need to talk about people, 
to make sure that change happens and happens well. We need to also make sure that central to that is a governance model which people understand and, and really actually support as well. And within all of this, it's about you, it's about people. And actually, one of the things which I think I'm seeing more and more happen in this marketplace is what are the skills that we need against this agenda of change? We're seeing that we need more generalists. We need people who are good negotiators and good communicators. We need to make sure that we have specialist knowledge that really drive the agenda around energy or water, whatever the issue might be, who can really add uh, important um, elements to that conversation. But equally important is making sure the client gets the building they want or the community they want. That combination um, needs one important ingredient, and that is leadership. When you start to see cities that are changing or clients that are driving the agenda, it is down to leadership. People who want, almost like uh, the alien quote I used at the very beginning, it's about knowing your mission and wanting to drive that change. And some organizations we're working with, the IKEAs and, and uh, those were, the, the, the board are making some really strong decisions in terms of how they want to make the agenda change. Um, this is a bit of a cheating slide in some respects because um, I try to actually lump into one slide all the things I have mentioned in the previous slides. Um, central to this conversation about change um, is about value, is about making sure that we can demonstrate value in all the things we do. It's about making sure that we're harvesting the data. We're collecting more and more information from our buildings. We're going to hear about the edge uh, today. Uh, there's a massive amount of information that's being collected and understood about how that building's performed. We're having some great conversations with people about BIM. Um, I was at Gatwick Airport recently. Um, they've designed uh, one of their terminals uh, using BIM. Uh, they saved 20% in the design process in using BIM, which is no small feat. They're saving even more, almost <coughs> twice as much, in the operation of that building because they know where all the services are, they know the materials, they know the supply chain. So when they're adapting that building, it's a much simpler process. And the turnaround in that building in terms of adaptation is important because if you close down a gate or a terminal, actually that's lost income. So they're seeing a massive return in terms of the use of data in terms of the design process. Um, ethics is becoming more important as well. We're seeing lots of company really proud in terms of their ethical agenda, where they're sourcing things from. There's been a lot of conversations in the last 12 months about modern slavery and what does that mean in terms of driving this agenda. And one thing we talked about last year a, a lot was the, the agenda about product to services. I'm seeing more and more people really getting engaged in this conversation about I don't want to actually procure, for instance, an HVAC system. I want you as a service provider to give me a temperature for the operation of this building or a lighting level. And therefore you're buying that as a service, you're not buying the equipment which will deliver it for you. So that, that product to service agenda is, is really, really changing. So I know I've thrown a lot at you, but so let me just kind of just try and capture the essence of that. For me, this is very much about efficient use of our resources. Um, the usual suspects are there. As we start to see an intensification of our urban areas, lands are becoming more important. Our models will change in terms of land price and what that means in terms of how we allocate it. Energy and water are, are important, but as are materials. <coughs> As we, as we change the way we live, as I said before, 90% of our time is spent within buildings, or, or on, on average it is, we need to make sure they're much, much healthier places. We need to make sure that our infrastructure and the way that we use it is much more efficient. We need to make sure we understand, you know, is centralization of our infrastructure or diversification the, the issue. Uh, Biodiversity is more important. Uh, one of the conversations I had just before we started was, you know, what is a truly living city? What does that look like? We have opportunities as we start to remodel our urban areas to actually bring some of that greenness and some of that, uh, that biodiversity back. And it's about enhancing our assets. We need to make sure we do that. And this is all about a journey. And I, I don't think I would have said this probably last year when I was with you, but um, I'm seeing increasingly people not just talk about net zero energy, but we're talking about 
energy positive buildings and there's two examples I, I showed you earlier on which is really about making sure we understand what that looks like that is happening more and more uh, our infrastructure our energy infrastructure needs to cater for that as well as we drive that process and as we have those buildings which we're either remodeling or we're creating we need to understand uh, where we're going and what the business case is but we also need to think about are we restoring the environment are we taking pressure off uh, the environment which we are always putting stresses and strains on that takes me past my first part in presentation so now we're quite a quick canter i think i've got about five minutes um i didn't want to throw at you lots of green buildings you've got um in your city and in your country a number of good examples and and, and this is one of them i suppose I wanted to kind of, in the, in the same tenor that I started, I wanted to give you a slightly different sort of insight, I suppose. So I was taking some of my inspiration from some of the buildings that are either um, part of, of what we know as our urban areas or, or new examples, and actually sort of look at it from a slightly sort of natural perspective. So all of us know the, um, the, the ability that Spine has to create webs. Um, this is a good example where somebody has taken that principle and actually reduced the amount of steel and materials they've used by strengthening the structure by using nature uh, um, as their real metaphor in terms of design. They've really designed a beautiful structure which has actually taken um, some of their inspiration from nature and it's reduced uh, the amount of materials that was used in construction. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the termite mounds in, in, in Africa and Australia and, and the Amazon. They are very cool spaces inside that, that fabric. What we're also seeing more and more is people taking that same design in terms of cross-ventilated buildings, in terms of external shading and applying it to buildings. There are multiple examples I could use. I, I have inserted here a Bream building where they've taken that principle and they've created a great space, not just in terms of the energy consumption that is being used in that building, but also the indoor air quality is improving uh, dramatically in terms of how it operates. But it also creates a great light space. The space inside is, is really lovely in terms of uh, a place to work, and effectively the impact is relatively small, an inspiration that has been taken uh, from nature. Another example on the same principle, uh, Portcullis House, which is um, the uh, location which um, MPs and ministers use in terms of their day-to-day -day business in Westminster. Another building which was taking its inspiration from, from that. Inside that building, and I've been there many times, it has lots of greenery, uh, it has living walls. The whole idea there is to make sure that the air quality within that building, because it's in an urban area and does have pollutants coming in from the outside, those living walls are there to drive that indoor air quality. So we can take inspiration from the environment and we can take great buildings, or we can create great buildings. This is a building going back a number of years. Um, there again, it's about creating light within buildings, it's about creating spaces which are truly uh, inspirational places to work. And where would we be if we were talking about buildings without having a, a Lloyd Wright building um, in terms of making sure that we're working with nature, but also the materials we're selecting are natural materials. Uh, we're very good at sometimes inserting um, man-made materials in our buildings, but some of the locally sourced or natural materials can create a great environment. Um, so understanding that and understanding supply chains becomes uh, important. Uh, another good example where they're bringing into the space um, uh, the external environment in terms of making it a really pleasant place uh, to work and live. And also here, this is about understanding how buildings work. Uh, a good example here of a building in design is, is about making sure that we capture that rainwater. I said before that water is becoming a more and more precious resource. There's an opportunity here to actually capture that water, to reuse it uh, in terms of the facilities uh, within the building. And we're seeing um, skyscrapers that are really thinking about bioclimatic conditions and how we can design them which really are sympathetic in terms of uh, design. The other point which I also wanted to reflect because it's very easy to, to talk about these buildings in a way which 
is about exceptional architecture. Uh, this morning I inserted an, an example of a, a fairly ordinary building. It's sometimes very easy to forget about the buildings which um, can be improved. Um, I've talked about this building before, I might have even mentioned it last year as well. Um, but the, the, the message from this year compared to last year is that is a, a typical existing building. Over the period of occupancy since 2009, they have driven the performance year on year down, such to the, at the point now where they are generating energy. So it isn't about creating um, energy positive buildings from new. This building is actually using new technology into an existing, fairly typical urban, sorry, typical uh, office building and making it improve year on year by understanding how people use the space, by making sure the technology is the best it can be. So when you talk about improvement, it isn't just about new construction and new materials and new ideas. It is about looking at existing stock and actually taking uh, the opportunity to improve it. So they're actually at a, what I think an quite impressive level now of uh, 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And that is actually going energy production, uh, not just energy efficiency. And as we start to talk about the issue about um, buildings being more efficient, um, there's some great buildings that are now designed and coming into construction where they're using um, elements of nature more effectively, making sure that you can really capture uh, the energy from wind or from solar and actually make those buildings not just great parts of our urban landscape, but also great examples of what an efficient building can look like. But the one point I wanted to, to make as well, it's very easy when we start to look at our buildings to make them uh, fairly boring, I suppose. Um, this is an example which uh, I kind of love. Um, we need to make our buildings, if we're spending more and more time in them, fun as well. Uh, this is an example where um, when it rains, the, the water actually goes through a number of uh, tubes and musical instruments and it makes noise. And the people in this building love it because it's actually a really exciting, interesting place uh, to work. So where to end? I started with a bit of a challenging comment about, you know, what's your mission? Um, I thought I'd leave as well in terms of uh, the world's changing. The world's changing in terms of because of us, because of the pressure we place on the environment. But also um, the business models are changing as well. Um, and I was putting together some examples of things that are happening around us, which sometimes we don't always think about. If you look at the way business models are working for certain sectors that touch us every day, they are radically different and it isn't always about having the resource, it isn't always about having the facilities. We're creating new opportunities. I just wonder what sometimes our, our, our business models for our buildings will be in the next few years. Thank you. There was no question mark in the last question. Was that a theory or a question? Yeah, in the built industry. Could you? I think that point I made earlier on about products to services, I think, is an example of how things are changing. Um, so I'm seeing more and more uh, technology service providers actually going to clients now saying, I can save you money by providing you the environment that you want and need, be it a lighting level or heating level, and I can do it at a much more cost-effective price because I can monitor how you use that building. I can actually put telemetry into some of the services within that space, and as things start to change or fail, I can come in and fix things before they even fail. So that product-to-service model, I think, is, is an example of that. I think there'll be other examples. I think as we start to see and revisit our urban areas, I think people will start to think about different business models. We know that land is going to get more expensive as we start to become into our cities and it becomes more complicated. What does that look like? As we start to look at our buildings, will we be always using the buildings as they are? Will we actually um, need to change them up and down in terms of adaptability? 
So can we plug things in? Can we uh, change the form of those buildings? Adaptability of buildings will become important as well. And also, lease model is changing as well. You know, years ago, I think uh, Interfloor were doing lots of work in terms of leasing new flooring. I'm now seeing a large number of other suppliers saying, I don't want you to buy my product. I want you to borrow my product and pay for it. And then actually when it's come to the end of its life, I will take it away and I will get rid of it in a way that I know it's been constructed. So there's lots of opportunities there. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing your view. No problem.